Quel est le but d'une expo sur l'Est, commissionnée par quelqu'un de l'Occident, sur des photos prises surtout par des photographes occidentaux et qui a lieu en Occident Est-ce que ces termes sont encore importants dans nos jours Comment on se positionne vis-à-vis -vis le matériel visuel de 1800 Quel est le regard que l'Occident a un siècle et demi après Opium, submission, kismet, lattice work, caravanserais, fountains, a sultan dancing on a silver tray, Maharaja, Raja, thousand-year-old Shah, waving from minarets, clocks made of mother of pearl, women with henna stained clothes, noses, working their looms with their feet. In the wind, green turban imams calling people to prayer. This is the Orient the French poet sees. This is the Orient of the books that come out of the press at the rate of a million a minute. But yesterday, today or tomorrow, an Orient like this never existed and never will. Like the Turkish poet, may those who search for the exotic be deceived. For this exhibition, we rely on the extraordinary photographic corpus of the CCA collection and look for the photographers and photographs of Pierre Lotti's time and propose an alternative reading. Indeed, during the 19th century, the East represented the realm of exoticism, fantasy, and mystery. Literature and painting provided perfect vehicles for fertile explorations of the unknown. In Europe, the poetry of Victor Hugo, Gerard Nerval, and the canvases of Eugène de la Croix, among others, fashioned visions of the Oriental world. In its infant stages, photography became another instrument that evoked these impressions. Several photographers had traveled to the Middle East and North Africa by the later half of the 19th century, bringing home images to Europe and North America. Whether in search of the Nile temples, Holy Land sites, or Berber costumes, whether amateurs, pilgrims, part of scientific missions, or commercial photographers, they all sailed to southern Mediterranean harbors, such as Algiers, Alexandria, or Tripoli, and journeyed through important cities like Cairo or Damascus. The reception of these urban photographs was imbued with Orientalism. Orientalism is a term commonly used to define the study produced by Eurocentric scientists and intellectuals regarding the historical and cultural set of the so-called societies out of the European cultural context. Orientalism was dedicated to research several civilizations in the Far East, India, Central Asia, Northern Africa and the Middle East, this last two currently referred as the Arab world. In the 1870s, French writer Gustave Flaubert defined an Orientalist in the, in the figure of a well-traveled man. Pour lui, c'était simple. Un Orientaliste est un homme qui a beaucoup voyagé. <laughs> Since the publication of Edouard Said's Orientalism in 1978, much academic discourse has begun to use the term Orientalism to refer to a general patronizing Western attitude towards Middle Eastern, Asian, and Northern African societies. In Said's analysis, the West essentializes these societies as static and undeveloped, thereby fabricating a view of Oriental culture that can be studied, depicted, and reproduced. Implicit in this fabrication, writes Said, is the, is the idea that Western society is developed, rational, flexible, and superior. And at a time when Western powers were looking to the Near East with an increasing colonial appetite, photographs helped to convey a sense of chaos and disorder, insalubrity, and a lack of self-governance. Overall, 30 photographers represented at the CCA collection saw their photos scrutinized in order to select the ones whose lens had focused on urban and architectural features rather than the anthropological gaze. Photographers are mainly European. Indeed, commercial photographers are just one of the groups of enthusiasts that decided to take advantage of the fashionable Orient at the time and, at the time, and shops began to appear. Cairo and Alexandria became the trade center at first, then Beirut, then Jerusalem, though very few Muslim-owned studios. Escape from pressures of daily reality, seek refuge in new and different vistas and interests, was a major reason for the massive flow to the East. 
regular steamer line from Marseille to Alexandria in 87, uh, 37 was started to work, so large numbers of travelers were crossing the Mediterranean, and by the mid-1800s, it was a fashionable thing to do. There were different groups. There were amateur photographers, usually tourists on pleasure trips that took personal travel snapshots. There were artists, mainly writers and painters. There were pilgrims, including missionaries and ecclesiastics vis uh, visiting the area. There were exploration parties, scientific expeditions, and this was actually one of the largest groups. And of course, there were military expeditions. This rush towards the Orient coincided with the invention of photography in 1839. So history of photography and the Middle East are profoundly intertwined. During the early decades of photography, no other area of the world excepting Europe was so thoroughly, thoroughly photographed as was the Middle East, particularly Egypt and Palestine. The earliest pro photographic processes were employed in the Middle East almost immediately after they were developed in Europe, such as the daguerreotype, the first process to enable production of unique images from a camera. Also, some of the first books to be illustrated with original phot photographs dealt with regions of this, uh, of this area. It seems their objective was sometimes focused on the ruined state of the visited cities that were in continuity with the ruins of the past. The Western image of the Middle East defined the subject matter of their photography and was restricted almost exclusively to the fallen grandeur of its past civilizations, its biblical antiquities and associations, and the inhabitants of the area insofar as they were picturesque or illustrative of how things must have been 2,000 years or more before. Most resident photographers remained on the East their entire lives. Tourism made it a profitable business. The remarks of Adrian Bonfils, son of Félix Bonfils and continuing the Maison Bonfils, typify the thoughts and aims of many photographers who worked in the Middle East during the 19th century. And I quote, costumes, types, customs, everything seems fixed in his immutable orient. Civilization, penetrating everywhere, will finish by taking away from this country its character and special cachet. A day will come when this land, like all the other, will perish. Before that happens, before progress has completely done its destructive job, before this present, which is still the past, has forever disappeared, we have tried to fix and immortalize it in a series of photographic views uh, we are offering to our readers in this album." End of quote. The touristic pressure and consumption refrained, delayed, and even stopped the real perception of the Orient and of the characteristics of the Arabic Islamic city in this case. It was much more interesting to keep up with a legendary image of the regions, its monuments, and its social habits. Context is, as with any historical source, crucial to the interpretation of these photographs, certainly provocative and suggestive, as Elizabeth Edwards puts it in Anthropology and Photography. The cultural circumstances included under the modern inter interpretative blanket, Western perception of the other, are central to the creation and consumption of photography in the second half of the 19th and the first half of the 20th centuries. Going to the Orient was going towards the remains and ghosts of our own history. The trip to the Orient was also, at least for the knowledgeable and educated traveler, a sort of, a sort of pilgrimage to the origins. In the beginning, photographers privileged landscapes and monuments, and, on, and, and only afterwards will they detail themselves at people. Technical constraints, which implied long times of exposures, were one of the causes. Yet, the first paradox of the, the, paradox of the Oriental pho photograph is that it's monochrome when compared to the colorful textures of painting. The vision was less romantic than painting, with nor the dramas nor the massacres of literature and music. The Middle East, which so preoccupied the mind and imagination of the 19th century Europe, was an image fashioned in the vision of, to the, of the West. Prejudices and preconceptions of the photographers, most of whom were foreign born, were mirrored in the images made, it, made during that time. 
Recalling Edward Said's words again, he characterized the pervasive forces conditioning Occidental thought about the Orient as, and I quote, so authoritative that no one writing, thinking, or acting on the Orient could do so without taking into account the limitations on thought and action imposed by Orientalism. Albums, illustrated books, and exhibitions, such as the World Exhibitions in Paris and, Paris and Chicago, flooded Western visual culture with exotic depictions of the East. Michel de Montaigne said in his essay of Cannibals in 1958 that the history of the European view of non-European peoples has always reflected Europeans' history of imagining themselves. In this case, of its picturing, picturing as so technologically and intellectually superior and developed that they could dispose the other in fairs and exhibitions. Carefully staged photos served to reinforce the impressions brought back to the West by such early travelers, most of them venturing in the fashionable grand tour that would lead them to the ruins of classical Greece, the exoticism of former Constantinople, the religious monuments of Palestine, and the stones of ancient Egyptian civilization. The extensive photographic activity was indeed an act of aggression, if not the physical occupation, a spiritual appropriation of those lands. Photography was in many ways symbolic of this unequal relationship. It represented technological superiority helping the control of the physical world. Non-European races who appeared less accomplished technologically were interpreted as, represented, as representing the childhood of mankind. In the case of the Middle East, as the cradle of civilizational standards that long have left the region and of which only Europeans were the detainers. Appropriation of most of the non-European globe and structuring responses to it was a set of assumptions concerning superiority of the white man and the duties and rights this superiority bestowed. There was an increasing dominance of ideas which placed value on technological and scientific achievements, of which the digging, the digging of the Suez Canal in 1869 is just the epitome. The second half of the 19th and early 20th century saw major colonial expansion and consolidation of European powers. The context in which photography must be understood and perceived is not only a cultural one, but also, and very importantly, a political one. This perception of the other, most powerfully manifested in theories of the race, is certainly intertwined with the expansion and maintenance of European colonial power. The rush of Western travelers and photographers to the Near East in the 19th century ties into the European political atmosphere of the period, the militaristic ambitions of France and England, and the condition of the Orient under Ottoman rule. After the misfortune Napoleonic campaign in Egypt at the turning of the 17th to the 1800s, from, mid, from early to mid 19th century, the military option was replaced by a cultural and economic colonization of the Orient, also a direct result of Western imperialistic and expansionist attitudes. What does it matter if the colonized, sorry, what does it matter if the colonized Orient gives more than a glimpse of the other side of its scenery, as long as the imaginary of the Haram persists, especially since it has become profitable? Hermé Desiré tried to depict Cairo as a European capital, looking to the traditional city from the western gardens of the European expansion of the urban assemblage. But blockage forces were powerful to prevent any effort of understanding the Arab Islamic urbanism from succeeding. If not, let's hear the words of Lord Cromer, British consul in Egypt between the 19th and 20th century. He said, the mind of the Oriental, like his picturesque streets, is eminently wanting in symmetry. His reasoning is of the most slipshod description. Although the ancient Arabs acquired in a somewhat higher degree the science of dialectics, their descendants are singularly deficient in the logical faculty." End of quote. The main criticism that the Orientalist photography has gathered exposes it itself as a factory of stereotypes, copying and passing cliches. Nevertheless, 
It relies on a body of recopied images sold to travelers, sometimes as postcards, that hides a richer and more complex reality of no less important images. So why not try and look beyond the veil? The development of photomechanical prints, of photographs that could yield multiple copies, allowed for the production of albums and portfolios on a mass scale. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. This became the privileged means for the dissemination of views of the Middle East, providing larger audiences with access to accurate depictions of significant monuments and contemporary urban spaces. Yet, through the very same images that served colonial appetites and Western configurations of the other, a different reality was already available to challenge these preconceived readings. These exhibitions of photographs, albums, and portfolios drawn from the CCA collection invites the visitor to abandon stereotypes and interpret the configurations of the traditional Islamic city as they were being offered to those who dare to break the frame of Orientalism. This contemporary reading offers a morphological turn in both architecture and urban studies, though through the examination of panoramas, streets, and monuments that can roughly be framed in five general sub-themes. Photography allowed for the recognition of notions, models, and concepts other than the known and accepted ones in the Western world. And starting the main room by approaching the city limits, for an Arab city, the fortified belt signals a clear border between inner and outer spaces. It constituted the first point of contact, or contact with the city for, for Western photographers, as for any other foreigner or visitor. The defensive system could only be penetrated through distinctively marked gates. This was, uh, this was the only permeable element in the city, a city characterized by a tissue that had been evolving from the early medieval times till the 1800s, and today recogni recognizable in many historical cores of Middle Eastern and Northern African cities. Walls imparted an image of the city as not only a compact organism, but also as an enclosed one. Seen from the countryside, they represented divisions between the traditional city call, Medina, and the sprawling neighborhood outskirts, Rabat. Such limits also reinforced functional separations. Early industrial activities were placed outside city walls, thus diverting noise and waste away from residential quarters. Cemeteries were located outside the walls as well, in a clear reference to the consistent zoning of the Islamic urban display. Fields of graves evolved into landmarking mausoleums. Early photographers became particularly obsessed by the quantity, magnificence, and state of ruin of some historic royal tombs. What interpretations did miss, then, was that these tombs for sultans were built on the outgoing path of the city towards Mecca, now the northern and southern cemeteries of Cairo. Again, they were insisting in a vision of a dead city, of a city of the dead for the dead, as these neighborhoods are still known, although now they house millions of inhabitants. Let us move forward to acknowledge other aspects of the urban character. High panoramic views offer an ideal perspective for quickly grasping the city as a whole, immediately communicating the notion of density. As privileged instruments of propaganda, urban panoramas often translate the view of an impenetrable, impenetrable urban fabric composed of labyrinths, yet they also reveal concepts inherent to the study of the traditional Islamic city. Cities are not the result of disorganized planning, but rather express a tightly woven social network. Cities spin around two clusters, the military and administrative sector, or citadel, and the Medina, intensively captured by early photographers. Cosmopolitan and mercantile, Arab cities have long been important trade centers, and this history is key in recognizing another specific urban sector, the commercial program. For example, open-air markets called souk and covered markets, Kesaria, can often be located next to mosques. 
These commercial areas work as important social knots, signaling human movement and interaction in a bird's eye view image. How to further interpret the city organization? Skylines represent fundamental tools for the interpretation of the city. Climbing over rooftops, urban photographers homed in portraits of dense and intricate clusters of residential buildings, allowing the identification of exceptional elements appearing in skylines, most especially minarets. Cityscapes show minarets rising from an apparently disorganized fabric that requires interpretation. What minarets actually signal are compact boroughs or neighborhoods gathered around a mosque. Traditionally, this system was indexed to the establishment of tribes in a new urban settlement. So each vertical structure is its most evident landmark. So a single minaret of a congregational mosque oversees smaller villages. One of the most distinctive features of Islamic architecture, minarets also carried a symbolic and referential impact at ground level. Size and decoration communicated diff specific programmatic meaning from the greater height and elaborate ornamentation of Friday mosques to the more modest appearance of neighborhood mosques. I invite you now to walk streets and alleys as traditional Islamic cities were built for pedestrian movement essentially. Photographs reveal a clear hierarchy between open public thoroughfares and the dead-end streets, or called sac, whereas the former usually connects gates, mosques, and major crossroads, the latter represents a semi-private alley only shared by close neighbors. Despite specific historical exceptions, such as Islamic takeovers of classical planned cities like in the old town of Damascus, or the establishment of royal precincts, long and linear streets perspectives are unusual, were unusual as a way to defend against the outsider enemy and the inside curiosity. Phot photographs kept many blind facades, symbols of intimacy and privacy, and often consoles hanging from upper floors, as you can see in this image on the left. These elements derived from a specific concept called fina, which also corresponds to the space immediately adjacent to the exterior wall of a house. It is allocated for the daily temporary use of the inhabitant of the house, to which abuts, for the loathing and unloathing of beasts of burden, and the temporary parking of such animals. Its application on the ground extends vertically, reflecting in the air. Air right structures, sabbats, are also related to the idea of utilizing both sides of the street, building a room over it, provided they do not obstruct passage. But now, inside the city, shall we dare to invade interior spaces? The courtyard is the basic spatial unit in a traditional Islamic city. Due to its regular geometry, it becomes the easiest feature to apprehend in photographs that abandon the supposed disorder of the streets. Since the cultural matrix of Islam favors enclosed spaces, courtyards of mosques are the semi-public squares the city does not possess. This feature is particularly evident for main or Friday mosques. A mosque is usually gathered around an open courtyard, as seen before, where the ablution rituals can take place. And once we step inside the prayer hall, one finds a hypostyle room with a wall oriented towards Mecca. Materials are brought in um, uh, in a detailed non-figurative decor that works textures and colors rather than concrete representations. So probably we should invade a little bit more and go from the holiest of the haram to the domestic haram and see that the, re the courtyard represents the private spaces of a complex or a building. Invasive in nature, photographs depict interiors where, once again, the display of architectural beauty prevails. Facades are turned inward, not to the streets, gathering the, fam the family nucleus and guests within an intimate frame. <laughs> the D1 looks over a haven where water and sometimes vegetation punctuate the space. Even in domestic courtyards, the public areas, the halal, 
are separated from the haram, the more private rooms, by wooden lattice screens called mashrabiya. This is the very this is the very last sample of social behavior that is present at all levels of urban organization, from the public, allowed or profane, the halal, to the private, sacred and forbidden realm, the haram. So wrapping up, the interpretation of these photographs acknowledges the contemporaneity and timeliness of such images. A portrait of an, urda, of an urban reality, from bird eye views to ground views, that photography brought to light more than one century and a half ago. 19th century had started with one of the most positive consequences of a failed military campaign. The Description de l'Egypte, published between 1809 and 28, as a result of the scholars who had joined the Napoleonic army, constitutes the basis for all Orientalist studies later conducted. It was the starting point for the modern urban recognition of the Islamic city, because besides surveys of buildings, topographical surveys of Cairo and other cities in Egypt were executed as well. Yet this urban and archaeological knowledge of these cities was subordinated to the cultural domination of the, bionomi of the binomium, imperialism, imperialism and exoticism that have in common the profound incomprehension of history and cultural relations. When one inquires to a corpus of large Arab cities situated from Morocco to Iraq, from Syria to Yemen, the major features of urban structure appear fairly constant and exhibit a rationale such that one can speak of a coherent urban system that still relates to the medieval periods. So 19th century photographs may well depict that portrait. Terminology has always been one of the most challenging aspects of the concepts and body of scholarship gathered. Yet, problematic terminological distinctions should always be contingent upon contexts. Shall we talk about Islamic cities or cities in Dar al-Islam? Sometimes we call them Middle Eastern cities, with an emphasis on geographical perspective. Sometimes we call them Islamic or Muslim cities with an emphasis on social relig religious interests. For instance, this time we call them Arab cities with a, 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 a more cultural specific aspect, just like we use for this research and exhibition due to the geographical coverage involved. Other terminologies have been tried with less success, such as Islamicized or Islamicate, uh, and, but concepts evolve as we speak and notions on contemporary concepts of Islamic, Arab, or Middle Eastern cities are dissolving in transversal process of modernization. These cities can no longer be isolated by, from the main forces shaping contemporary cities, yet a close look, a clo a close look sorry, to their old cities mirrors similar conclusions of denial and avid will of technological progress, this time today, by another agency and agenda. For now and here, we wanted to demonstrate how a series of architectural and urban representations of mosques, tombs, or streets could have also provided material for cultural and ideological scrutiny already in the 19th century and show the validity of the scientific value and exploration of such photos for the purpose of the traditional Arab Muslim Medina study too. Um, a knowledge that was already available at the time pho photographs were being produced, and at a certain level, photography stopped the orientalistic depiction that literature and painting allow with no limits. However, on the other hand, both massive tourism and geostrategical political games control the information and the image of the Orient to be preserved. The pressure of the column power over a discriminated and colonized region insisted on revealing cities as having no order nor system. Photographs offer us a perspective of what was being proposed to the eyes of the international community then, a perspective never assembled in the way the CCA is proposing today. So I invite you to the salon that never took place in the second half of the 19th century you're not late. Photographs are certainly not late. The separation of a set of images regarding urban spaces that instigated scientific curiosity for the understanding of, the, of alternate urban codes were never provided by any specific spe exhibition back then. 
One wonders if history had been different, always in vain. The traditional struggle that the laicized West has to deal with cer certain social environments where religion still plays a fundamental cultural role and conveys direct matrices for the urban identity, and this was vividly remembered by more recent reactions to Middle Eastern conflicts or the 9-11 events, reinforces the scope of a contemporary approach. So, salawa ahlam, and welcome to the show. Bienvenue au salon, et merci beaucoup de votre attention. Thank you very much.